Welcome to Cardio Radio, a podcast of the Ohio Cardiovascular Health Collaborative, also known as Cardio. This is Dr. Michael Constant from the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, and I serve as the principal investigator for Cardio, a statewide network of Ohio's seven medical schools. Cardio is funded by the Ohio Department of Medicaid and shares best practices to improve cardiovascular health outcomes and to eliminate health disparities in Ohio's Medicaid population. I hope you enjoy today's podcast. I am Elise Karen, Practice Improvement Coaching Lead for Cardio's Team Best Practices and Associate Professor of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. Today's podcast will address how healthcare systems approach the joy of work and conversely, provider burnout in the context of quality improvement work. With me today is Dr. Peter Pronovost. Dr. Pronovost is a world-renowned patient safety champion, innovator, and critical care physician. He recently joined University Hospitals of Cleveland as its Chief Clinical Transformation Officer. Dr. Pronovost's scientific work leveraging the use of checklists to reduce central venous catheter-related bloodstream infections has saved thousands of lives and earned him high-profile accolades, including being named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine and receiving a coveted MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant in 2008. He is also a prolific researcher, entrepreneur, and global thought leader. Dr. Parnavost has published over 800 papers throughout his career. At University Hospitals, Dr. Pronovost is working to develop and lead strategic initiatives to improve value across the health system. He is the clinical lead for population health and leads high reliability medicine with direct responsibility for the UH Employee Accountable Care Organization. He directs teams that engage UH providers and employees in care models leading to improved outcomes and a healthy workforce while reducing the cost of care. He is also responsible for leading the growth and adoption of digital health, including telehealth and virtual health, solutions to better serve the patient and provider communities. Welcome, Dr. Pronovost. Thank you. It's great to be here. So the goal of this podcast is to address how health systems approach the joy of work and conversely, provider burnout in the context of quality improvement work. So Peter, what do you think about the word burnout and does that put the onus of responsibility on the physician and how might we address that? Well, first, at least just uh, for context, you know, burnout is such a critical issue. It's, you know, nearly half of the people who are caregivers, physicians and nurses alike, and it has negative consequences on virtually any outcome, whether it's the personal outcome in their life, their family outcomes, and tragically patient outcomes. And people who are burnt out are numb to new improvement initiatives. So until you address that, your ability to think we're going to implement some improvement efforts is really a fool's errand. They just can't process it. The quadruple aim uh, seeks to address that. It's it's a uh, an approach that seeks to have four key components. It seeks to make sure we have uh, better health at lower cost, a better patient experience, and that we address the provider burnout issue or framed in the positive uh, provider joy. Now, we don't actually know that they're the inverse of what drives one leads to the other, but there's a lot of research going on in that area. You know, safety is my background, but it's the exact same thing. We looked at errors in healthcare when we push it on the provider and saw this was a personal failure. It's not productive. Things don't get solved. And it's much more powerful, I think, to frame it as how to create a joyful work environment where our employees are resilient and thriving, right? Because that will have an individual component, but that puts the appropriate responsibility as looking at the broader system and as the leaders of those organizations to make sure that their job is to create that type of environment. So what do you do to help staff reduce or avoid burnout? Yeah, these great uh, question. And I uh, think of this at three levels, like we're taking a systems approach. The first is the intrapersonal level, and that is making sure we acknowledge and uh, train on and make resources available for self-care. For self-care, we mean ensuring people are getting sufficient sleep, that they are managing stress, and they, perhaps most importantly for us in healthcare, practice self-compassion because we often are really, really hard on ourselves, especially when uh, we make a mistake. I think too often health systems rely solely on that, and though it's important, 
uh, and helps, it's not where the bigger drivers. The second is interdisciplinary support, and that is how are teams nourishing and supporting each other, whether it's a recognition that your colleague did something really well, whether it's an arm around someone who made a, a mistake, but encouraging teams to be mindful and supportive of um, this work. And finally, at the organizational level, and I think that's where enormous opportunities are, and I think about the organizational level as kind of perhaps the positive or proactive and more eliminating defect side. The positive um, side is aligning everybody around purpose and key principles. You see, we are so fortunate in healthcare to have the gift of helping to heal people, and whatever purpose statement do you have for your health system? They all fundamentally are really inspiring. It's almost impossible not to get you excited to come to work every day because we're really privileged to touch the lives of those who we serve. But we too often hide that or perhaps we're not comfortable aligning around our purpose and our purpose often degrades to RVUs or productivity or meet your numbers and that's demoralizing. And just vocalizing that this is what our purpose is, and it's an honorable purpose, and we are so privileged to do that, uh, is re really inspiring and aligning for, for people. And we do that through our rituals, through our rhetoric, through our recognition systems, and through the rewards that we do. We also have to have a leadership style that empowers and energizes and inspires people, and fundamentally, without having a fancy MBA, what that means is do things with rather than to people, with rather than to. You see, we know in all of our change effort that change progresses at the speed of trust. And trust grows when people have a stake in what they're co-creating, that, that they feel part of it. And again, we too often burn out and disrespect clinicians by telling them how to do this something without ever saying why it's important or what the goal is. And I think as leaders of these efforts, our job is to keep our paws off of how. That's for the people closest to the work to figure out. But our job is to say why we're, we're doing this, again, that link to purpose and what our goals are, and then make sure they have that enabling resources or the, the infrastructure for product management for data so that they could figure out how to do it. And the more eliminating defects you know, the physician burnout is driven by many very real systematic uh, failures of our healthcare systems to support uh, our clinicians. And so while the self-care is important, you know, the correlation between putting in an EMR and, and burnout is incredibly real. Matter of fact, if you look about what we bought from the ER, EMR, the most visible thing we bought is burnout. It's a very expensive burnout from an organizational and, and a personal level. And it's not that we didn't need to be digital, but it does mean that we didn't honor our clinicians and we put things that were clunky and clumsy and we didn't understand the burdens on this and we often just said, go use this tool. And when clinicians voiced to say, but it doesn't work for me, you were viewed as a bad apple and yes, you will do this, you know, just soldier on as opposed to say, no, let's assume they have positive intent and if they're saying there's a burden here, we should honor that wisdom and let's go figure it out because there's very real burden. So we have clinicians spending two hours at night writing notes or um, trying to keep up on their chart after work when they should be with their families or doing things that they want to do. And so I think as leaders of an organization, you need to view the dissatisfiers of clinicians as defects, just like you do an infection and a medication error, and have a systematic process to identify those and address those. And that might not need a full reporting system. It might mean focus groups or clinicians and say, tell us the five things that are really uh, dissatisfiers for you that, or that waste your time that you could be doing other things, and then manage those uh, opportunities just like you would manage any other projects. Because we know much of the EMR pieces are, when you look at it, yes, there may be some fixed things, but most of them are modifiable. I just share with you, I was at the St. John Hospital and we did a forum with the their president, Rob David, and all their medical staff that they were really frustrated with the EMR. And it, admittedly, it, it's really quite clunky. But what we found out from listening to them and many, many focus groups 
is that most of the physicians didn't know how to use the tools to optimize them. For example, there's this thing called a dot phrase where it's basically a macro. If you put it in, it'll type in your operative note. Well, we had surgeons literally almost in tears to say, do you know this dot phrase saves me 20 minutes a case? And several of them were very short, rapid turnovers who might do 10 cases a day. And they're like, you know, Peter, this is a life changer for me. And it was just closing that gap or more perhaps having the courage to ask them what really bothers with the EMR because so often when executives hear it, we shut it off that we don't want to hear it. They're just whiners. And instead of saying, okay, no, let's try to surface what's the underlying issue that we could try to address. So long-winded answer of saying we need a systematic approach of providing individual supports, interpersonal supports, and most importantly, organizational uh, levels. So what can providers and their healthcare teams and patients or families, for example, do to really improve the joy of work, eliminate burnout? What Can they provide you with any information? At least great qu- question, and I'm so glad you asked that because so often when we speak with clinicians, they feel powerless about this burnout, right? If they haven't, and many of us do, it's like this curse that I'm carrying around with and they feel alone and there's not, nothing that they uh, could do. And we know, per- personally, there's some things you can do, like each night thinking about three good things that that happened, or taking moments to notice all, whether that's the sunshine in Ohio in the middle of the winter, <laughs> or looking at a mountain, um, uh, or spending time with a friend or your uh, spouse or partner just uh, b- being together. But there's also things they can do within the organizations, right? And I would love to see care teams on units or in clinics make a list of the top three to five things that make work hard or that reduces the joy of, of their work, that are things that could be addressed, and then have a conversation with your managers where you commit to be part of the solution with them to say, let's go take a look at these things and how could we uh, evolve them and mature them because those burdens aren't fixed for the most part. There's, they're almost all modifiable, indeed modifiable with either little or no resources. And we should have that improvement lens that you bring to your work applied to how to create improvement in our work environment so it's more joyful. Thank you. In my experience, when teams are empowered to make improvements, they tend to find that joy in work. And how do we find time to take away from the clinical activities and let the teams really do some of this improvement activity so that they find the joy in work? You know, at least that's um, a great point. And I was remiss in not saying a solution for burnout or for joy, because as you just alluded to, every performance improvement team we've ever done, especially when it was their first team, clinicians uniformly say, in all types, you know, physicians, surgeons, nurses, this is why I went into healthcare, right? I mean, it literally touches their soul in in a way that the treadmill of clinical work doesn't, or at least in a different way, but clinicians want to be able to create a system that gives great care. And when they participate in these improvement works, you can literally see their eyes light up and, and, and they're energized and they see the results moving in the right direction. And so I think you're, you're spot on. Participating in one of these is really essential. The key is how do we get time uh, to, to do that? And fundamentally, it's all of us have to convince organizations that this waste and defects that are occurring are really costly and reducing them produces an ROI. And we've seen it, you've seen it in your work over and over again that you know, improvement doesn't just happen with telling people to run faster. You really need to create what I call that enabling infrastructure. That is some support for staff time, data analytics, project management training, uh, so that we could get the great results that our providers desire, that people deserve, and that the public's demanding of us. And I, I think that's a really great response. I- some of our listeners are going to be coming from really small health centers and have limited resources to do that. Do you have any suggestions for how they might be able to address yeah. burnout and joy and work in, in, their, in those smaller clinics that have less resource, fewer resources? Yeah, great question. And uh, you're spot on. So many of our health systems are really struggling for resources, and especially the, the inpatients as their margins go down. You know, they're cutting a lot of this quality uh, I- I- improvement. A couple things that... You know, 
each of us, I would think of ourselves as the CEO of our own 10 square feet or 100 square feet or whatever it is. In other words, we build or break a trusting culture, a resilient culture every day and every minute of a day and how we choose to react to different situations. And so we could choose to be supportive of each other. We can choose to see the good in people. We can choose to thank our, our colleagues for what they do. We can choose to tackle tasks that may not be uh, extending outside of our own health system or even our clinic or my area, but I could begin to do something in my day to say, what's something that's either harming patients or adding cost or reducing joy that we could begin to work? And my experience is that kind of improvement mindset is infectious. That if you were to go ask your colleague to say, hey, does this bother you? Or you know, do you struggle with this every day? And people say, yeah, of course it does. And they'd say, well, why don't we both get engaged in this and try to learn and improve it? Because the reality is we spend much of our days in healthcare recovering from defects, but rarely learning from them. And by recovering, I mean, I treat that patient. I, I, I do what needs to be done to, in the moment to care for that patient. But I don't step back and say, how do I reduce the probability that this happens again? In other words, how do I learn? And what we've seen is the collective time that we spend reducing defects is far more than we would spend if we spent a little bit of effort in trying to, to learn. And so I would say pick an issue, reach out to some of your colleagues and see if they want to join together to do something. And, and that's how I was taught to do quality improvement was to focus on something that bothers me or, and something within my sphere of influence. But right now, I think organizations have quality goals and they have all of these metrics that they need to meet. And when teams aren't necessarily interested in working on those metrics because that's not what's bothering them, then they don't get a lot of support for those QI activities. How would you suggest they address that? Yeah, so that's a great uh, question. And in, in all organizations, there's just an explosion of quality metrics. And some of them are valid and important. I could say as a physician and a quality person, some of them are really invalid and they're checkboxing that probably have negative value because they don't really impact those, those we serve or any important outcome. That said, many times you have no choice. You work in an organization. If this is the organization's goals, you have to, to play to the test. But what you could also do is build on that. So you probably can't not participate in those, but you could identify other opportunities that would be aligned with one of the strategic goals of a health system. So for example, everyone is looking at reducing waste or uh, staff time or cost. So pick something along that line and say, yes, I know I need to do this, but look at this opportunity about how we use supplies or the drugs that we order or fail to order for people. And that's, could we also begin to focus on that? Or readmission, something that might lead to a readmission or some complication that adds harm and adds cost. And I guarantee you, most executives, if you were to do yes and, in other words, okay, sure, we'll do these things, but I also see an opportunity here, are really interested in finding other opportunities to improve value. Along those lines, do you think it's important to teach the teams who are doing quality improvement and may not be doing something that's a system priority or an organizational priority to develop their business case for quality? Yes, without a doubt. I think that, you know, and it's not an easy skill uh, to do, but, you know, I think in any intervention in healthcare, whether it's you know, in an ACO, having a nurse navigator or having a pharmacist reach out or having a social work reach out, all those interventions have cost. And uh, we need to make sure that the improvements exceed uh, a, a greater amount than that cost. So I think thinking about that makes sense conceptually. The reality is we often spend a ton of time to do it. And I find oftentimes it has to be not necessarily a leap of faith, but that's conceptual, like it makes sense. For example, one of the real challenges with business cases, we will always undervalue and never invest in things that improve culture and burnout. Because what do I show for ROI if I'm making work more joyful? Even though there's a ton of literature that says, you know, people are more empowered, they're more productive, their outcomes are better, you know, or safety culture, you know, getting someone speaking up about uh, an adverse event or 
or even air reporting. You know, there's these rare events that it's hard to justify those uh, kinds of cases, and you could spend a lot of time making business cases for uh, some things that you have to say. You know, I believe that I believe as a great organization, we need a culture where we support speaking up, and I'm going to put in investments in to create that. And I weigh those investments probably by the potential for their impact on speaking up, not necessarily on what an ROI is going to be. There's other things if you're building a new building or investing in a new program or new staff, absolutely do an ROI. That approach, though, is relatively straightforward. It's easy. I think it's these subtler things where I... Um, may not have a great business case. And I think in those cases, it's a great opportunity to pilot something. Say, I don't know what the business case is. We don't really know what the impact will be, but why don't we just t test in this one unit? The costs are relatively small. We at least have enough hypothesis or hunch that the business case should exceed this, but we'll test it in a small area where even if it doesn't work, it, it's not all that much of an impact. Well, thank you. That was very helpful and informative, and I think our listeners will really appreciate that. How do you actually do that? So how do you balance the needs of the workforce with the needs of the patients? Yeah, that's a um, brilliant uh, question, and, it's, and you know, there's a lot of um, approaches in healthcare that say patients come first, they're the only things that matter, workforce just suck it up. I would say the literature probably fairly convincingly would say that approach doesn't work, that your employees have to come uh, first or it's a key step in a process. And you know, this isn't a theoretical thing. This is think about the staff as an intervention and the patient is, is the outcome. They're the means by which we produce the outcomes. And so if we have a, um, a gap or some uh, staff who are suffering or ill-equipped, we're not going to get that link between what the behaviors they do or the therapies they provide and, and the improved outcome. So we have to view them as really our most important asset uh, that we have. And I think too often uh, we haven't. And around the, the country, I think we viewed um, clinicians, and I would say nurses in particular, in particular as an expense. <laughs> they're, they, the, instead of seeing the add value, I look at what their budget is, I see in most health systems, they're 60% of my labor, and we view them only as costs, so we cut them. Their burnout goes up, they try to have them run on the treadmill more, and we know there's a threshold when you cut, your costs go up, that you're actually deluding yourself to think you're saving money, your total cost of care, because of complications and turnover, go way, way up. And most health systems, I think, are below that threshold, that they're at the point that patients are suffering and staff are suffering and we would have lower cost if we bumped up our ratios or reduced the variability in the demand, but stop viewing staff as a commodity. So if staff are burned out, and we know that staff are burned out and clinicians are burned out, how do you improve team and staff engagement then? Yeah, really, really tough question. And, you know, so often when there's an organizational issue that may have budgets, the normal response is we can't talk about it. So I don't want to hear about the EMR. I'm tired of the docs whining about it. That's all you talk about. It's off the table, right? Or nurses always complain that they're insufficient staffing. It's not, I don't, I don't want, to, want, to, want to talk about it. Yeah, okay, we could talk about burnout, but don't go, go bring up the, the staffing levels. And I think that approach uh, is never solves the issue, right? You need to be, uh, as I think, uh, the three key values for improvement are being humble, curious, and compassionate enough to really seek to understand what people are saying. And so that means it's an open conversation to realize that, yes, burnout is an issue. We understand our staff are working really hard and authentically ask and listen to what people's challenges are. doesn't mean you're going to promise m more staffing, but I can share with you every time you do that, you find microsystems where there's real problems, right? That we think of staffing as this, you know, monolithic thing, but there is either, well, sure, we have nurse staffing, but we're really short on techs or nurses' aides, and so the nurses are picking up someone else's role, and, you know, even though the ratios might look, from a nurse's perspective, they're working way above capacity. Or there's one unit on a part that has a, is short, and their workloads are really high, or the technology is not supporting them. And I think having those conversations to, um, to, to address that. Uh, also, that leaders 
um, a very powerful tool is just asking the question. That, that having a safe space where a leader could say, "Hey, I understand. You know, our you're working really, really hard. Um, our tools don't serve you well often, and uh, I understand you. It, it's really hard." And give that uh, authentic, hopefully uh, empathic understanding about what the day in the life um, is of our clinicians, I think really goes a long way of people feeling hurt. The reality is our clinicians are smart enough. They, they know we don't have an uh, open bank, that, that we have to work, you know, balance productivity pressures and burnout and safety, and, and people are willing to respond to that. But when they don't feel heard or they feel they're just invisible, which is you know so often how they feel, it's really demoralizing and it, burnout will suffer and patient experience will, will, will suffer. You know, one of the things that I learned, at least, and it's such, I think, a gift for us in improvement, is when you peel away the terms like quality and safety or high reliability, burnout, what you find is the kind of culture that makes care safe and high quality is the exact same culture that makes patient experience great, is the exact same culture that makes work joyful, right? And it's this culture that I call a culture of love or a culture of connection. And that's the ground pinning of all of that. You get that right and you'll have a great organization, but you get it wrong and every one of those three things will suffer. They may suffer to very extents, but that underlying root is the cultural problem. Thank you to our featured guest, Dr. Pronovos, for joining us today. And a special thank you to our listeners for tuning into Cardio Radio. This concludes today's podcast. Be sure to visit cardio.org to learn more about the Ohio Cardiovascular Health Collaborative.